Amen. He's good, isn't he? It's good to sing that to him. It's good to tell each other about that. It's a good thing this morning. You can turn in your Bibles to the book of Colossians. We'll continue in our study of this book, verse by verse, Colossians, with the series entitled, The All-Sufficient Christ. Christ is all-sufficient. It means he's good enough. Uh, Enough doesn't even scratch the surface, though. Enough makes us think like there's a lack. Uh, there is no lack with Christ. Uh, he, he, is, he has everything that we need and far more than, than we can even imagine. So we'll turn to Colossians 1, 15 to 23. Hear now the word of the Lord. He, being Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister." This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, now I pray that as we've heard your word, that your spirit would take it from our head, help us understand, help us see things that we we would see without your help, and then shoot the truth of your word down to our heart and, and dig it deep down in our heart. Set it home there. So then our lives would spill over into the glorious truth of the gospel of Jesus, that he is all-sufficient for all things and supreme over everything. And it's in his name and for his sake we pray. Amen. The message entitled this morning is Christ's Universal Supremacy. Yeah, I know it's a little cute, but you'll get it. Christ's Universal Supremacy. Last week we came to understand Uh, that our prayers should be aimed at the growth of the gospel. Growth that God himself provides. And so what we do is we give thanks to him for the growth that he's given, and we pray that he gives more growth of the same type that he's already given, and then we give him more thanks for that growth, and then the cycle goes on and on. And this is how we grow spiritually as individuals and as a body of Christ. But here our text this morning is actually a hymn, It's an early Christian hymn, which is written to sort of recalibrate our hearts and our minds to the universal plan that we find ourselves in. Sometimes we get so caught up in our own personal stuff that we don't realize what God is doing is on universal cosmic scale. It's huge, and yet we're a part of that. So this this hymn exalts the all-sufficient the all-supreme Christ. Now, this passage uh, that we just read is so central to Christianity. And the question behind it being, who is Jesus? How is he God, like God? The the question is, is a big one. It's so central to our faith that the first worldwide council of the church met to discuss this very passage. This very question. On May 20th of the year 325 A.D., 
230 bishops of the church gathered at a, at a city called Nicaea to adjudicate, one historian says, to adjudicate the meaning of Christ's divinity, to figure out what this means that Jesus is God. Imagine that just for a second, right? You're, you're in the early church and you're working through just understanding what these texts mean and, and gathering together as believers. Well, so at this council then, they came out with the, the, uh, um, the Nicene Creed uh, that goes through and says exactly what. You can look it up. Um, I, ha- I was going to have it with us, but then I left that book in the office. But anyway, it's also at this council, as a side note, where uh, the real St. Nicholas uh, is said to have put himself on the naughty list by punching a guy in the face that said that Jesus uh, was not God. I, 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 frankly, I like a, a Santa that takes his theology seriously. Uh, but it, it's a very important topic. It's a very important council. Uh, but the, the point is, is that it's this passage that we are looking at this morning that, that the Roman emperor thought that it was so important that we understand this for our faith that he called the, the leaders from across the Christian world to come to one place so that we could get it right, so that we could understand who Jesus is. It's so central to our, to our worship. So what do we see about Christ in this passage? Well, if you've been with us since October, uh, we actually went through this passage in the series The Five Solas. Uh, we, talk, we use this passage to talk about how Christ is our only authority, how he alone is the head of the church. So I'm going to kind of skim through some of those first verses and then shoot you back to YouTube uh, if you want to see the message to, to see more about um, verses 15 to 20. But we'll at least give a, a summary here. So first of all, Christ's supremacy we see in verses 15 to 17, Christ's supremacy in creation. Right, we read, he is the agent of of creation, the firstborn of creation, for by him or in him all things were created. Now, this of course means that Christ himself is identified as God from Genesis 1 1, who created the heavens and the earth. Jesus of Nazareth is God. Right? We start off just plain as day. He is God. He created all things. God created all things. Jesus is God. So what Paul does is he encourages these Colossian Christians to to deepen their knowledge of the Lord by acknowledging, even in song, the deep, sometimes even mysterious truths that Jesus Christ, the man who walked on this earth, is also the source of all things. He He is the one who created all the world. Right? The, the one who lay underneath the star in Bethlehem was the one who created the stars. I mean, let that sink in for a moment. The one who created the wood or the stone <laughs> that his manger was made out of was the one who laid in it. Jesus is the agent of creation. All things came through him, in him. They were created by him. But he is also the heir of creation, the H-E-I-R. In other words, he inherits creation. Now, throughout the history of the church, it's been fairly commonplace every, I don't know, 50 years or so, that you have somebody that writes a book or a paper or preaches a popular sermon or something about how, how God is, is like the, uh, he, he's like a clockmaker or like a watchmaker that, that intricately created this world and all of its detail, and then he sort of wound it up and then just put it out there in the universe to let whatever happens, happens. Right? This, is, this is the theory of Thomas Jefferson and some others that just believe that this, this world is so detailed and so intricate that there has to be a creator God behind it, but he doesn't have anything to do with the world now. Right? He doesn't need to. Gravity's got that. Right? Like There's laws of nature that take care of all that stuff. Th- this watchmaker theology, this, this theory, is so far from the text of Scripture that it, it, doesn't even, it doesn't even land in the realm of Christianity. No, all of creation was not made just so that God could send it out there and look at something shiny that he made. No, it was for him. He created everything so that then he could inherit everything. 
He, he made his own inheritance. All things, that the text tell us, was created for him. Do you see that in verse 16? Right? He is both the beginning and the end of it. He's not distant, but we see that he is also very active in creation. Look at verse 17. Verse 17, the, the, the last half of it, serve as the main central point of this hymn. In him, all things hold together. I'll show you how, that, how we get to that being the central point later. But just for now, just notice, Jesus is actively, actively holding up creation. He is active in creation. He's not far and distant off just watching everything take place. But as we've heard testified this morning in our midst, no, we pray and he works. He does things. He's close to us. He is Emmanuel. All things are, are held up, I think it's the book of Hebrews that says, by the word of his power. Right? He, he created the world with his word and he sustains the world with his word. Everything continues to spin because Jesus is on the throne, holding all things together. My, my kids got me a sweatshirt for my, my birthday this last year that says, Christ or chaos. Christ or chaos. Those really are the only two options. Either we have Christ in the world, holding it together, superseding, being supreme over all things, or we have chaos in the world. Things fall apart. Things don't work as they were intended to. So do you see something in the world that is just lovely? It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's genius. It's well-designed. It's efficient. Something that's orderly. Something that just works. If you see, if you notice that, it's because Jesus holds all things together to make it beautiful and to make it orderly and to make it efficient and to make it work. He created the world where certain colors match. He created the world where certain laws of nature work together so that you can drive a car down the highway. <laughs> he, he, he created the world in such a way that you could get in a metal tube and fly for thousands of miles without coming down intentionally or unintentionally, right? This is the world that Christ made, and he holds it all together, right? We can, we can try to, to, to live in this world on our own, but without him being the center of it, it all falls apart. So do you see chaos in your world? Do you see disorder in your world? Do you see confusion? Or frankly, do you even see ugliness in your world? Why is it? Well, it's because whatever it is, it's not acknowledging that Christ is the center of the creation. You're, people try to go off and, and we become hostile in our minds, the text tells us later. We become hostile in our minds to Jesus being the one who orders all things. So we say, no, not that way. I'm going to try it this way instead. Well, what do we get then? Of course we get chaos. Of course we get confusion. This is the world that Jesus made. He is supreme in it all. He is upholding everything by the word of his power. Of course, we need to function in the world like he intends us to. Are you seeing this? Does this make sense to you? Christ is supreme in creation. But you know, it's often when life falls apart, when life is in confusion, that people start looking for some sort of spiritual fulfillment. Isn't that interesting? That when things get tough, when crisis happens that's when we acknowledge the fact that we need some spirituality in our life, right? That's when we acknowledge that I need to be filled up here. I need something more than what I had here, right? It's in crisis when we all of a sudden realize that there's got to be something more than what I've been living my life by. When everyday life presents very, even just practical challenges, family struggles, where do you turn for help? Right? We know spirituality is the answer, but what does it look like for you to turn to spirituality? Do you go to Barnes & Noble or do you go to Amazon and, and pick out the, the bestseller in spirituality and read that? Or do you turn on a, a certain preacher on TV that is 
uh, you know, he's smiling and he's telling you that Jesus wants to fix all of your problems and make all of your problems go away for a low payment of 1995. Do you make an extra donation to the church? Because when you do that, it lifts your spirits a little bit. You feel better about yourself. You feel more spiritual when you do that. How, how do you seek after more spiritual fulfillment? What do you go for? Now, all those things may be good, but when they are separated from Jesus being the supreme ruler and the creator and the sustainer of the universe, all of those things will only lead to more chaos. Do you understand what I'm saying? That if, if, if you listen to a preacher that is telling you that the world is going to get better, that, that you are going to have a healthy and a happy life, and he, yet he does not turn your eyes to Christ, to trust in Christ, as our memory verse has been telling us, Christ who suffered, uh, if he doesn't tell you that your life is going to be one of taking up your cross and following him, if he separates you away from Jesus, who is supreme in the world, it is only going to lead in your life to more chaos and more struggle. We cannot have spiritual fulfillment. Paul is telling these Colossians with this hymn, we cannot have spiritual fulfillment unless and until we acknowledge that Christ is supreme in the creation. All things are created by him. Now, this gets really messy if we, if we really believe this. This can get, really, uh, can really get into your business, so to speak. This can change things pretty massively if you believe that Jesus is supreme in all areas of your life. Because if he's supreme in the way that you go to your job tomorrow morning, then things are going to change. If he's supreme in your parenting, then things are going to change. If, if Jesus is supreme in your marriage, or if he's supreme in art, or if he's supreme in business, or if he's supreme in science, or politics, or education, or entertainment, if Jesus is the one through whom all those things came, and he is supreme over all those things, then it doesn't hardly matter at all what my opinion of those things are. It doesn't matter what I think about how I should run my business, if Jesus is supreme over it. It doesn't matter what I think about parenting, if Jesus created that for him. Right? We submit ourselves, if he is Lord, we submit our every aspect of our life under what he says about that thing. And next thing you know, things start changing. Things get messy. Your life is going to be turned upside down, but notice, it's going to be turned right side up. Because Jesus is the one who created all that to be in order. And he tells us exactly how he wants that to happen. He gives us all the guidance that we need. But it begins by us acknowledging, Lord, you are supreme. You're supreme in the world. This is yours. Secondly, we see Christ's supremacy in the church. This is verses 18 to 20. He is the head of the body, the church. Right? Christ is the arbiter of creation. It means he works out a deal between God and creation. Because he created everything and all things are ultimately his, he takes it upon himself to correct the corruption that's in the universe. Right? Because we, re we realize Christ, if Christ is supreme in the world, you look around you, things don't look like he's supreme. Do they? Right? There is chaos. Sometimes you don't have to look very far to see the chaos in the world, right? Sometimes it's right in my front doorstep, right? So then the, 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 the question is, how, how, does that, how does that jive then? How, how does Christ go about bringing things back into order? And the answer is through the church, his body, of whom he is the head. Now, the head of a body, it's the source of life, right? You eat and you drink with your head, you see and you hear and you smell and you taste with your head, you think and you decide with your head. The head directs the affairs and provides all things that are necessary for life. So what is Jesus to the church? He is our head. He is our source of life. He is our direction. The text tells us here, 
uh, in verse 18 that he is the firstborn from the dead. Now notice the parallel here. Uh, it, from verse 18, look back up at verse 15. What does it say he's the firstborn of there? Creation, yeah. So in verse 15, in the first stanza of this hymn, Jesus is the firstborn of creation. In the second stanza of the hymn, he's the firstborn from the dead. Now where did, where did death come from here? I thought Jesus was supreme. I thought that he was upholding all things by the word of his power. I thought that in, all, in him all things hold together. How do we get from Jesus is the firstborn of creation to Jesus is the firstborn of of the dead. Well, verse 19 and 20 send us there. It says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. See, the reality is that we live in a world where there has been a broken relationship between our Creator, He is supreme. He did create all things for himself, and yet all things did not acknowledge him as creator. And they still don't. Things are broken. Things don't work the way that they should work. We do have sickness, and we do have strife, and we do have conflict, and we do have pain and suffering and hunger and all these things. We do have sin in the world. So how does he go about fixing that? How does he go about making it right? The answer is through the church, through the redeemed, reconciled people of God being brought back into relationship with him. So now what we have in the church is a microcosm of the creation, right? We have among us a, a group of people who are now in right relationship with their creator. Now, what did it take to get there? The text tells us his death. Whose death? Death of the Son of God. Death of God himself. God himself is the only one who could finally offer the sacrifice that actually puts us into right relationship with him. Right? He himself did that, and then in him, we, the church, are brought into that relationship, and we submit ourselves to his supremacy in all things. He is the sacrifice that finally puts an end to death. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 55. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? There, there is no, that we have the victory in Christ Jesus. Right? We, we, we no longer, death no longer has that sting. It no longer holds sway over the creation because in Christ, all things that are against Christ are once and for all put under his feet in subjection to him. In him, all things are held together, and he does it through the church. Now, I said I'd, I'd, I'd show you how verse 17 is the center of this passage. We've we're, we got to understand how these two stanzas of the hymn, verses 15 uh, through 16 and verses 18 to 20, how they relate to each other, and then we can understand how you and I fit into this universal plan. So just, just let, let's do some hard work here, okay? This is Bible study in the, in, the, in the round here, in the, in the big group, okay? There's some parallels, first of all, that if you're looking for repeated words, you're going to see between these two stanzas in verses 15 and 16 and 18 and 20. So first, notice verse 15. He's the firstborn of creation. I'm sorry, back up. He is the image of the invisible God, right? What does it say in verse 18, the last part? He is what? He is the beginning, right? So he's the image of the invisible God. He's the beginning, now look and see, you see he is the firstborn in verse 15 of creation. In verse 18, he's the firstborn of the dead. Now there's some other connections here that, that are harder to see because they're in Greek, but I'll, I'll, I'll point them out to you here. Verse 16, we read that for in him all things were created, literally is how it's translated. Verse 19, it's for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Uh, another phrase, verse 16, through him. All things are created. Verse 20, through him all things are reconciled. Again, verse 16, through, uh, for, uh, for him all things are created. Verse 20, uh, to reconcile for himself. Okay, lots of connections between these two passages. Verse 16, there's another connection. All things in heaven and on earth. Verse 20, all things, whether on earth or in heaven. 
right? These parallels between these two passages kind of bounce our eyes back and forth, kind of like a funnel. We're getting closer and closer down. They're narrowing down to where we get to verse 17 and 18, where it says, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Dead center in this passage is that in Jesus all things are held together. So what's the point of all these parallels? The point is that the church is the plan for God to hold all things together in the world. Do you see how I got there? The church, the second stanza, is the plan for creation to be rightly ordered to, their, to its creator. Jesus is doing something in the church. And it's more than just gathering us together so we can sing some songs. No, in the church, he is creating a microcosm of what this creation was meant to be. And then he's telling that us, the microcosm, to go into all the world and to be a light to the nations. Show them, here's what it looks like. I don't know, do you have such a high view of Christ's supremacy in the church? Do you see that that's what he is doing? When we gather here on Sunday morning, this is what we're doing. We are ordering ourselves according to the cosmic plan of the universe. And I'm not exaggerating. That's true. This Christ hymn, there, there's another connection that I'm not going to take time, but basically 18 to 20, if you look at your cross-references in your Bible, there are tons of references back to chapter 2 in, in the book of Colossians. And chapter 2 is describing what these false teachers are telling these Colossian believers. So what, what he's saying is, in, in this last part, is he's saying, oh, by the way, chapter 2, uh, the, 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 the problems that you're dealing with in chapter 2, the solution to that is the church. In fact, it's the hymn of the church. I love this. This is, this is like worship is like warfare here, okay? Paul gives the church ammunition to fight against the false teachers, he says, do you want to have a stable and steadfast foundation against all this weird ideology that's in your world? Sing. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? He says, sing. And, and he says, here, I want, you, I want to tell you what you should sing. Sing about Jesus. Sing about Christ. Sing about how he is supreme over all things. Sing about how all things will one day bow the knee to him. Sing about how you as the church are brought back into reconciliation with him. Sing these truths. And they'll dry, you won't even think about these false ideologies. There's no way you'll be able to be led astray into false teaching. Right? You are so strong and steadfast in these hymns of the faith because they are, they are so strong and steadfast in the truth of the faith that you will not be shifted. You will not be moved to other ideas. You will be strong in the Savior. There is some power in music, friends. I'll tell you. And we've got some, something planned that hopefully next week I can tell you about, but that goes along this, this idea. There is some power in music. We see it in the text this morning. Now, our last heading here, I admit, again, I, I got a little cute with the title, right? Christ's universal uh, supremacy, but it's true. Christ is supreme in the universe, and that's, that's true in as much as he is supreme in you and me, right? His supremacy in the universe goes as far as individual people. It's not like we can just say, yes, I know, Christ is supreme, he created the world, and then he pushed it off, and now it's, now it's over there. No, we are, he is supreme in my life. Right? If, you've, if you've fallen asleep so far, if this theology has been like, whoa, that's, so, that's up here. Uh, Paul knows that, by the way. Right? That's why he, part of the reason why he says to sing it. Singing helps us understand things. But, but, but now is the point, okay? So we get to verse 21, and what does it say? And you, plural, he's saying, you, okay, so for those of you from the south, y'all, and y'all who once were alienated and hostile in mind. What does he say about us? We were hostile. We were hostile. Now, he, he says the main verb, we were alienated, which means we were cut off. 
Right? This means this is actually a passive verb for those of you in Bible study. I told you we're going to see some things. This is a passive verb, which means that the alienation was done to us. The cutting off was done to us. Right? Our sin, we came into that in Adam. We, we sinned against our Creator, and then the Creator sent Adam and Eve out of the garden. Cut them off. And ever since, all of humanity is cut off from the Creator. But do we deserve it? Well, of course we do. We're no friendly aliens. It says that we were hostile in mind. Notice where the hostility begins. It's in our mind. Don't you often think that hostility comes out our fingertips? Comes out of our mouth? Well, it does, but it starts in our mind. We have minds that are not oriented according to Christ's supremacy in the world. We have minds that don't want Jesus to be in charge of our life. We have minds that don't want Jesus' word to guide the way that we parent or to guide the way that we uh, interact in politics or to guide the way that we interact in our business. Right? We don't want Jesus to be in that. We just want him to be in Sundays. Right? And that's a hostility. That's saying, no, I don't want you here. And then what happens is that hostility does come out our fingertips. One of my favorite authors says that, that our worldview comes out our fingertips. The way that we see things, we're going to act on. And he didn't get that. He's not original. Like, that's what Jesus said, right? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's here is going to come out, right? And that's why he says you are doing evil deeds, right? The sin in the world comes from a mind that is set against God. But this, friends, can be rather subtle because there are, there are we together, right? He's writing to Christians we together can still hold on to some hostility of mind. We can still have areas of our life where we say, no, thank you, Jesus. I've got plenty of resources over here to make this decision myself. Right? We, 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 we shove Jesus away sometimes when he says, no, I, you don't realize I'm supreme over that. I'm ruler of that. You need to subject yourself to me in that. Sometimes it's out of ignorance that we don't do this. We didn't know that he cared about the way I ran my business. We, we, we didn't know that he cared about the way that I parented. I, I didn't know that the Bible said anything about politics. In fact, I was told the very opposite. Right? We're, we're completely ignorant to some of these things. Right? Sometimes it's out of laziness. I know what the Bible says about this. But man, if I really let Jesus come in and, and say how I need to function in my marriage, that's going to be some hard work. I'm going to have to change a lot. If, if the way I ha I'm running my business wasn't under Christ's su superiority and now it is, I mean, that's got some pretty big consequences. Sometimes it's just out of laziness. And then other times, unfortunately, it's out of defiance. We flat out say, Lord, I know what your word says, and I don't want that in my life. I don't want that kind of marriage. I don't want that kind of relationship with my neighbor. I don't want that kind of business dealing. I don't want to do it that way. I'm just fine by myself. You stay in your Sunday, Jesus. But Christ is supreme, and he must be supreme in you and in I. We were hostile. Secondly, we were reconciled, verse 22. Right? The, the fellowship that happened at the beginning of creation in Christ has been brought back into fellowship. Right? The fellowship that was lost is now brought together again. Right? This is, again, a passive verb. We were reconciled. He did it to us. He brought us in. Right? Sometimes we get so wrapped up in wanting to say that I did my salvation. Right? No, I chose Jesus. I made that decision. Right? Why do we do that? Well, because we don't want to give up on my, the will that I have in my life. We don't want to give up to Jesus' complete supremacy in the world. Right? We want to have some control at least. Right? But what his word says is, no, you were reconciled. He, uh, he sought you. He brought you back in. Right? And where, where were you? Well, you were alienated. You were hostile in mind. Right? The word tells us that apart from his working in us, our minds are set against him. Not, not, not looking for him. Right? We don't want Jesus unless if he gives us a renewed mind. 
unless if he changes the way that we think, unless if we see him as beautiful and supreme. And look at the great lengths that he went to to do this. It says that he gave his body of flesh by his death. He sacrificed himself. He took on a body. He spilled his blood, verse 20 said. He, he died on a cross. And it's in this sacrifice that we are brought back together with him. Friends, just take a minute to view the mercy and the grace of God in Jesus. Look at what he has done for you. Look at the lengths that he went for you. Look at what he, what he gave up for you. Look at what he took on for you. Look at how far the creator of the universe is willing to go to bring you back into relationship with him. Believer, your heart should leap at this. Your heart should swell with love for your creator at this thought. You should be so, so, so humbled and so overjoyed at what Christ has done for you that, that is, if you're not moved to tears that you want to sing or you want to do something because I just cannot believe what God, has done for me. If, if you're sitting here this morning and, and at these words, your heart doesn't do anything. There, there's, there's, there's nothing that happens. I just, I want you to ask yourself the question, are you the one that is hostile in mind? Are you set against Jesus and his supremacy in the world? Have you decided you don't want anything of him? Maybe it's through ignorance. Maybe it's through outward defiance. Maybe you have thought about Jesus and you don't want anything to do with it. If that's you, just, just notice that your life will have chaos. Yes, you might be able to order some things here and there because you mimic what Jesus says about the world, but you're not doing it for his glory. And one day you're going to bow the knee to him, Philippians says. One day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Right? Every single person will one day confess the things that Paul says we ought to be singing about today. So why not today? Why not join in the song today and claim that Christ is supreme and let him mess up your life? Let him get in there and change stuff. Why? Because it's best. It's not chaos. It's good. It's, it's blessing. It's joy. What's he going to do for us? He's going to bring us and we will be presentable. That's our fourth, our fourth heading underneath this. We will be presentable. Right? This, this work of God in us is headed in a direction. Verse 22, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Right? Being presentable has something to do with who you are being presented to. Do you understand? Being presentable has everything to do with the one you are going to be presented to. Right? So if you're going to be presentable to a date, somebody you're going out on a date with, you're going to dress a certain way. You're going to make yourself presentable, right? You're going to act a certain way. If you're going to go before a court, before a judge, you're going to present yourself a certain way. You're going to act a certain way. Well, who are we, present, who are we being presented to? The God of the universe, <laughs> right? The, the one who created all things, including you, and created them good and perfect. So, so what do you think we should look like? What does it look like for us to be presentable? Well, he tells us here. What words does he use? He says, we be holy and blameless and above reproach. Now, those are sacrifice words. Those are words used to talk about a lamb in the Old Testament, what a lamb needed to be. Yes, we must be holy, friends, to be presented before God. We must be a fully pleasing sacrifice. But the beauty of this is that he does this for us. Remember, Jesus is the one that created all things, and all things are for him. So do you think he's going to leave it up to you and I to get ourselves cleaned up to go and be presented before God? No, of course not. The word tells us that he who began a good work in you will bring it about to completion at the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, who's doing the work? Who's making you and I holy and blameless? It's not me. I'm, I'm terrible at that. No, it's God. Christ is preserving. Christ is taking his bride, his, his beloved, and he's picking her up. He's polishing her off. He's clothing her, clothing her in a white dress 
in order to present her on her wedding day. Christ is, is taking his inheritance that's been buried, that's been tarnished and, and tattered and torn, and he's fixing us. He, he's polishing us off. He's making us look beautiful so that then on that day, he get, we get presented as his glorious inheritance. Jesus is doing this. He is changing the world through the church. Do you believe that this morning? Do you? Sometimes we get really down on our position in the world. Sometimes we get really depressed at what the church is doing or is not doing in the world. We look around us and we think, man, is Jesus even working? Like, our church is looking good, but the world's not changing much. No, Jesus' grand cosmic plan is to change creation through you and I. Do you believe it? We will be presentable before him. And lastly, we must be steadfast then. We must be steadfast. Now, this is a condition of our lives if we show up before the Father. This is not a threat. This is not Jesus saying or Paul saying that you're only going to get to be presented if you are steadfast. No, he's saying we will be presented, and here's what your life is going to look like before that. You'll be steadfast. Now, that doesn't remove the warning here. There is a warning. If you look at your life and you see that you are not steadfast in the hope of the gospel, if you see that you have shifted away to some false ideology, you do not have hope of being presented before the Father. If you, have not been, if you are not firm in the true foundation of the faith, then there is no hope. There is no assurance. But what this verse tells us is, for those of us who are trusting in Christ... What trusting in Christ is going to look like is remaining steadfast. It's like telling a, a, a runner that, uh, that you're, not going to, you're not going to finish the race if you don't cross the finish line. Or you're not going to cross the finish line if you don't continue racing. Well, duh. <laughs> right? like you're, how, how am I not going to get to the end? How am I not going to get to the goal if I don't continue on that path? Right? For the Christian, how am, I, how am I going to get there if I don't continue on? That's all he's saying. So be steadfast, immovable. Right? What, what does the text say? What are we steadfast in? The hope of the gospel. Right? It's the gospel message that, that buys us, that brings us in, and it's the gospel message that holds on to us for our lives. Do you have that hope this morning? Do you have that steadfastness? Are you shifting? Are you, are you, are you off into some other weird ideas? <laughs> Trust Christ. Look to him. Let's pray. Father, we've gotten to look on you, and you're beautiful. You're glorious. You're majestic. You're supreme. You're sovereign. You are strong. And Lord, we have, we, some of us in here, we have, we have seen that in our lives. And some of us, we haven't quite seen that yet. And I pray that you would show yourself strong on their behalf and on our behalf. Draw us to yourself. Lord, fix the world through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, we see verse 23. I love that. It says,